Um, all right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee. O heavenly King, comforter, the Spirit of truth, who abides everywhere and fills all things, treasury of good things, giver of life, come and abide in us. Cleanse us from all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. All right. Yes. Welcome. 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 All right. Let me uh, hold on. Let me admit a few people here that are trickling in. Um, so, um, you know, I'm just going to dive in. Um, we uh, had last last Monday off, but now I don't think we have any more Mondays off until we're done. I think there's this is the seventh class. And then I think there's I think there's two or three more. I can't remember, but I don't think there's any more breaks. I think everything is just every Monday going forward. Um, so let me share my screen um, here. How's that going to happen? Hold on one second. I'm trying to figure out how, how to do that. Um, um, let's try it now. Here we go. So hold on one second. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we, you know, we've covered a lot of stuff and we've actually moved a lot slower than I was hoping we'd move, but, uh, so, so be it. We've had a lot of questions and stuff, so that's good. Um, so today we're really just going to continue. I, what I've done actually is these first, I think three or four slides are actually, uh, from last month, the last Monday that we met just to sort of bring us up to speed and refresh our memory as to what we were talking about. Um, and really what we were talking about broadly and what we're going to be talking about really throughout the rest of today is uh, a term that I call divine economy, which um, I'll read this, this quote here. It says, divine, divine economy is the name given to the totality of miraculous events worked by God to make us once more his own. Uh, the economy of our God and Savior as it relates to man, says St. Basil, is the raising up of man from his fallen state and his return to kinship with God from the alienation caused by his disobedience. So it's a very sweeping concept. Um, broadly, it means sort of everything God has done, uh, every way in which God has sort of inserted himself in history, you know, for us to see, uh, ultimately to arrive at the incarnation of Christ, you know, his life, his passion, his resurrection, his ascension, the, the sending of the Holy Spirit, and now sort of where we are today in this kind of, um, hold on one sec, um, in, in this state really between, sort of where between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. So that's, that's the divine economy. And the last thing will be, of course, God's final coming, um, which hasn't happened yet. So, um, so again, this is kind of review. Uh, salvation had to overcome three things. So when, when after man had sort of disobeyed God and been cast out of the Garden of Eden, there were basically three things that were impediment to us being reunited with God. Um, and those things were um, the fact that God is uncreated and we are created. So there's a sort of a, an essential difference in, in our essence, you could almost say, between us and God. Right? And of course, if you're attentive, you'll know that that is bridged in Christ, right? Because the uncreated and the created have become one in the person of Jesus Christ. That's point one. Um, the separation between a, a, a sinful man and sinless God. And again, you know, a little review, that also is bridged in the person of Christ, right? Because Christ is the perfect man who does not sin, right? So that is bridged in him. Because really, I mean, again, our salvation really is, is in Christ. I mean, Christ basically is the bridge that takes us across the chasm that we otherwise couldn't cross to get to the kingdom of heaven, basically. Um, and then lastly, death, right? I mean, God, God is alien to death. God, death doesn't impact God. But it, it impacts us, right? And so through Christ's life, his death, his resurrection, his overcoming of death, 
he has overcome all three of these things, right? In him, in himself, in his, in his person. Um, so, um, oops. So again, just kind of talking a little bit more about divine economy. So the whole Old Testament, which is to say everything that happened before the coming of Jesus Christ, is sort of the priming of the pump of salvation, right? So this is sort of God getting us ready for the coming of Christ, sort of the final final manifestation of his final work that's going to get us in good standing again with him. The Old Testament was preparing the people for that. Um, and then the bottom quote, God sought in many ways to bring man who was forever distancing himself close to him again, but without violating his freedom, right? So we've talked about this many times, but one of the most important things in this relationship between us and God is our freedom, right? I mean, and really, if you think about it, and, and this is kind of self-evident, there's no love without freedom, right? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't create a robot, right, and train the robot to come up to me and hug me and say, I love you and that be love. I mean, we all know that's not love. That's just a robot who's been programmed to do that, right? So love has to be in the framework of freedom. And so God's love, basically, rather than sort of compelling us, the, the way I might, you know, if my, my child does something bad, I might pick him up and put him in their room and say, stay put. God doesn't do that. God, uh, God brings us to himself by saying, you know, I love you. Come. There's good things. Come. Come to me. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, um, back at the quote here. He first then summoned him back, schooling him in many ways by the means of divine manifestations and by the law and the prophets. So that's what he did before the coming of Christ. All this had as its aim man's return to a blessed life. However, since it was sin that had brought death into the world, the future Redeemer, Christ, had to be without sin, and so not accountable for death because of sin, right? So the reason we became captive in Hades to the devil was because we had sinned. We had disobeyed God. So the only way to sort of overcome that is to not disobey God. And so that's what we see in the person of Christ. Christ was perfectly obedient. And, and as such, um, when he died and Hades sort of tried to take hold of him, that Hades was like, wait a minute, you haven't sinned, so I can't have you. I, I don't have a, a stake on you. Um, so anyway, this is what we were talking about. These are, these are from last week, and this is the last one, I think, from last week. Oh, no, there's one more. <laughs> you know what, and I'm going I'm to skip this. So one of the things we said, too, uh, regarding divine economy is that, and I, I, I find this interesting, is that in the creed, the creed is really a summary statement of what we believe, right? So I think it's interesting that in the creed, there's nothing really about the life of Christ, right? It, it, it's it, All the creed tells us, and I have it here at the bottom. If you look at that, um, let me do this here. Hold on. You can see my laser pointer. So we're down here at this quote. So this is the creed. It says, that, talking about Jesus Christ, it says, he came down from heaven. Right? He was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became man. And then it skips the totality of his life. And it jumps all the way to the end. It says, and was crucified. Right, So it's interesting that that is skipped over, even though there's important things in that. But, but those are the main high points. Those are the main kind of touchstones of what Christ has done. And so part of it, too, is I'm sure that the fathers were, I, I think, well, I would say two things. Obviously, they didn't want to have the creed be too long. And second of all, I also think that um, they, there wasn't a lot of controversy over his life. There wasn't a lot of controversy over the fact that, yeah, he performed miracles. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah he taught that. But there was controversy over whether or not he actually became a man. Or, or maybe he was just a phantom and wasn't really a man. So these are the things that are talked about. Anyway. We'll keep going. Um, so that's the end of the review from last week. And now we will continue. Any, um, any questions or comments real quick? Uh, just anything from last week? or? So anything? just, Father, from what you, yeah. what you just said, the three things salvation had to overcome, and the sinful man and a sinless God, I understand that, and death. The separation between the created and uncreated, I know that there are some fathers who believe that Jesus would have become incarnate 
whether there had been a fall of man or not. It, I mean, that one seems to be a gulf that would be there whether there was ever a fall or not. I, I get my question, I guess, is pretty open-ended. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, 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 the only thing I would say to that is that um, it, I, 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 I don't have a great answer, but what I would say is that um, if nothing else, the fact that he bridged that gap shows how much he loves us, right? It shows really the, the, the magnitude of the condescension, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to say. I, I get what you're saying, and it's difficult to answer that question. I don't really have a good answer for it. Um, but if nothing else, uh, I would say that it certainly points to the fact that there was really nothing God was not willing to surrender, right, to, to save us. Right. He wasn't, you know, because he could have, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people. I'll be like, well, you know, he could have just and, you know, you can almost imagine this discussion between God, the father and Christ. Right. Like right before the incarnation. And Christ is like, what? <laughs> I'm not going down there. You know, those people, they made their own mess. You know, they've made their bed. They can sleep in it. Right. Obviously, that's not what happened. But um, thank God. But um, but, you know, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers or helps, but that would be my thought. So any other comments or questions? Janet, you look like you were leaning forward. You got to unmute yourself, Janet. There. Um, this is, I don't know why this thought just came in my head. You know, on the gravestone, they have our year of birth hyphen, our year of death. The hyphen is everything that happens in between. And I just thought of when you were talking about the, the birth and the death, you know, sure. of Christ. Ours is kind of the same. Yeah. It's pattern. like a hyphen in the creed. You're right. Between You're right. when he was became man and when he was crucified. So, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. true. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, let's keep uh, let's keep marching on here. Um, so, um, so, so far. Oh, was there another question? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I heard somebody talking. Maybe that was just background noise. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so. Oh, that's uh, so um, the incarnation of God. So let me I'll read this this page here. Man's disobedience. You know what? Hold on one sec. I think hey, hey. I'm going to I'm going to mute everybody just so uh, we don't have any background noise. So just so you're aware, uh, let me share my screen once again. All right. Um, so man's disobedience to the divine command created a gulf between him and his creator. We've talked about that at length. Um, and this gulf was bridged by divine condescension when the second communion of man with God. So the first communion was in the Garden of Eden. The second communion was when God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, um, when that took place. Had God not descended from heaven and had man not approached the bosom of the Father when Jesus ascended into heaven, there would be no communion of man with divine goodness. Now, let me explain something in this. It might be a little confusing, but it's, it's I think, very important. So he talks about how um, God beca Jesus became man, right? That took place. And then it says, had God not descended from heaven and had man not... Let me change this. Hold on one sec. Hold on. Oops. Oh, sorry. Let me do that again. Um... Oh, no. Okay. Um, pen. Here we go. This is what I want to talk about. So, had God not descended from heaven, and had man not approached the bosom of the Father. So, what he's talking about there, just for clarity, is Jesus Christ, right? So, a lot of times when we think of Christ, and this is a very important thing to be mindful of, when we talk about Christ, we have to understand that he is fully God. And we usually have no problem understanding that. We usually think, even like sometimes people will talk about like the crucifixion and they'll be like, well, it wasn't that bad because he was God. It was kind of how they'll chalk it off. Um, but what we also have to understand is that he was us. So not only did he represent God to us, but he represented us to God right? That's what he's talking about here. And had man not approached the bosom of the Father, that's Jesus Christ as a human, 
right, representing us ascending into heaven. So it's, it's a little bit complicated, but it's important because he, he is that. He represents us. He, he is the perfect man. He is what we were intended to be. So anyway, um, so let's keep going. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is sort of, um, I want to talk about sort of the events of divine economy and, and sort of what they are and what they did and what they're about and how we can understand them. Um, and they're pretty, I mean, they're pretty simple. You'll, you'll know them all probably. Um, the first, of course, was the Annunciation, right? Because chronologically, that's when Christ, you know, literally took on human substance, right? He became, you know, they basically became a fertilized egg in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Um, followed by uh, his birth nine months later. Um, followed eight days later by his circumcision and the giving of the name, which is the practice uh, among the Jews. Um, the presentation in the temple when he was 40 days old. Uh, his baptism, and now we're jumping ahead, you know, to basically when he was around 30 years old. Uh, the transfiguration, which probably happened when he was about 32 or 33. It was right before the passion. Um, the passion, um, the resurrection, his ascension into heaven and then the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So we're going to talk about those sort of in the context of what they mean for salvation. So if you have any questions, as always, just, you know, don't hesitate to jump in. So the Annunciation um, as the foreshadowing of Pentecost. So one thing that's really noteworthy about, about um, the Annunciation is that the Holy Spirit, I mean, in a sense, the Holy Spirit is always permeating the whole of the universe. In fact, the prayer we said at the opening of this class was a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And it, and it says, um, who art everywhere present and filling all things, right? So the whole universe, the furthest star in the furthest galaxy is sustained by the Holy Spirit, right? And that's the case everywhere all the time. Um, I think what the church would say is there's also a unique way in which the church operates in the church. So it, it, the, the Holy Spirit operates in a sort of a broad, sustaining way for the whole universe. But for those who are baptized and chrismated, uh, it, it operates differently. It operates in a, in a more palpable way. We're not going to talk about too much about that today. But what's interesting at the day, the, uh, the day, day of the Annunciation, the Feast of the Annunciation, is that the Holy Spirit comes down, just like he's going to do you know, 33 years later on the day of Pentecost, he comes down and he descends on the Virgin Mary and, and, and incarnates the Son of God in her, right? So it's almost like a, a prefigurement or sort of a pre-taste of Pentecost, right? So it's interesting because Annunci the Annunciation is sort of the first event, right? We just talked a minute ago, right? The Annunciation is the first event and the Holy Spirit's descent on Pentecost is the last event. And they're both this action of the Holy Spirit coming down into the world to do something, right? So it's just something to be mindful of. So there's sort of a correlation or a connection. Um, at the Annunciation, the Archangel says to the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. We just said that. Um, at Pentecost, we will have the final out, or we have the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the person of the Holy Trinity who makes things happen, right? So in the case of the Annunciation, he, he descends and he basically, you know, makes the Virgin Mary pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in the case of Pentecost, he basically empowers the church to go out and do its work in the world, to spread the gospel. Um, uh, the Virgin Mary's obedience to the will of God, and this is another sort of, sort of neat little correlation. The Virgin Mary's obedience to the will of God, where she says, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be unto me according to your word, counters, right? It's the opposite of Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, right? So we see oftentimes the Virgin Mary is, is sort of billed as the new Eve, right? So here it says, Christ is the new Adam and the Virgin Mary is the new Eve, right? So she, and I'll, I'll just take a, a little tangent. It's interesting too, because even Christ, so by in the Virgin Mary's obedience, right? She sort of undoes the disobedience of, of, of Eve. And even with Christ, we actually see something very similar, right? The first thing Christ does, right? So in the, in the, in the gospels, we see, 
Luke and Matthew talk about the birth of Christ. They're the only ones that talk about the birth of Christ. John actually talks about sort of the pre-eternal existence of Christ. So like in the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, he talks about it. And then he sort of goes into the life of Christ. Um, but the first story we read about sort of the adult Jesus is his going into the, into the, into the desert to be baptized by John. As soon as he's baptized, I think Matthew, Mark, and Luke say this. I don't know about John. As soon as he's baptized, he goes out into the desert to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Which is, the fathers tell us, the exact opposite of what Adam did, right? Adam was given a fast, don't take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And he disobeyed God, right? And the first thing Christ does in his adult ministry after being baptized is he goes out and he obeys a fast, right? So it's interesting. And I don't know, something to think about. Um, the Virgin Mary serves as the locus for the incarnation. Um, for the Son and Word of God to take on flesh, uh, a locus was needed. When I say locus, I mean like a point, like a place, um, uh, where the union of divine and human natures could be forged. Uh, that place was the most holy and all pure Virgin Mary. So that's the Annunciation. Any comments or questions so far? Anyone? All right, we will continue. Um, hold on. So um, the next sort of chronological event after the Annunciation is, of course, the birth of Christ. And it's noteworthy, actually, if you look in the calendars, right? The Annunciation is March 25, right? And you count nine months later, and you arrive at December 25, right? So you see that just as, you know, that's the gestational term of a human being is nine months. And so that's how the church works these out. You know, let me say one other thing too. This is a bit of a tangent, but, and I've probably said this before, but it, it is, it, it's important for us to understand that the, the calendar of the church, the calendar of the church, and here I mean, all the different events that we experience, the Annunciation, Christmas, everything, the whole year, all 365 days. Basically, obviously, the, the, the culmination of everything, sort of the pinnacle of everything is, is Pascha, Easter, right? But the purpose of all of that really is to catechize us, right? Uh, the, the purpose of the calendar of the church, I mean, Sunday school is, is, is good and great, and I, 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 there's nothing wrong with it, but really, what we should be doing is we should be in church, uh, forgive me, but we should be doing things in a language that everybody understands. Um, and we should be there for orthros. We should have, if, if we can, we should have an orthros printout or we can have it on our iPhone and follow along because all the hymns that we read, that is what makes us theologians, right? Not Father Pondelamon's Orthodoxy 101 class. <laughs> Forgive me, but but it's the it's the worship. So really, it's that cycle of worship that the church has instituted. That's what makes people holy. That's what makes us holy. So, sorry. Back to the story that we're at. Um, so the birth of Christ. Um, we talked about the nativity being six uh, nine months after the conception. Okay, um, the nativity of Christ is a theophany, which is a fancy word for the appearing of God. Uh, that is to say, a divine manifestation of God in the world. God appeared in the flesh, which is from 1 Timothy 3.16. This means that God the Word took upon himself a human body and was revealed to the world as theanthropos. So the word theanthropos is two words. It's theos, which means God, and anthropos, which means man. So he is the God-man, is what we're saying. This manifestation of God to the world is the beginning of our entrance into the world of God. St. Gregory the theologian writes, he who, well, hold on, I can't see it, let me do this. Um, he who is not carnal, meaning God, carnal meaning, carnal means a flesh. That's what carnal means, you have flesh. Um, he who is not carnal becomes incarnate. Right? It's kind of a play of words, too, with carn and carn. The invisible becomes visible. The Son of God becomes the Son of Man. And he who gives riches to others becomes poor, assuming the property of my flesh, so that I may assume the richness of his divinity. Right? So, and it is really, it's powerful to think that God 
who has everything, right? Everything is God's, right? And yet he emptied himself. Where was he born? He was born in a cave because there was no place at the inn, right? I mean, he totally emptied himself. He could have been born anywhere. He could have been born in, in a palace in Rome, and he could have been surrounded by all the courtiers of the king, right? But that's not what he did. And that tells us something about the God we believe in. So uh, let's keep going. So the birth of Christ, the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of man, meaning us, uh, that is of Adam, might become sons of God. So that's, that's the, one of the kind of central statements of, I, I don't know if that's exactly from St. Athanasius, but basically it's the essence of that, is that God became man so that man, you and I, men, could become God with a small g, with a small g, I would say. Um, and this is, a, this is a quote from a homily by St. Nikolai Vilimirovich, which it, it really doesn't, it doesn't add to it, but I just thought it was such a beautiful quote that I needed to insert it. So it's a, it's a homily on the, on, the, on the day of Christmas, on the birth of Christ. That's and he, sa he says, quote, he says, quote, oh. it's a real, you're going to like it. Oh, hold this, on is huge. Let huh? me... this is huge. This is huge. You're going to eat it more. Okay. We have a little uh, sound there. Hold on one sec. So um, St. Nikolai says, quote, Look now at the Lord Christ. All is obedience and humility. The Archangel Gabriel, who appears, right, to tell the shepherds, uh, the representative of the angelic obedience and humility. The Virgin Mary, obedience and humility. Joseph, obedience and humility. The shepherds, obedience and humility. The wise men from the east, obedience and humility. Storms, obedient. Winds, obedient. Sun and moon, obedient. Men, obedient. Beasts, obedient. The grave itself, obedient. All is obedient to the Son of God, the new Adam, and all is humble before him, for he also is unconditionally obedient to his Father and is humble before him. So I don't know what that adds, but I just think it's a beautiful quote. So um, moving on. So after the birth of Christ, uh, it actually is, for in our calendar, it falls on the 1st of January, um, which also is the feast day of St. Basil the Great. Uh, we celebrate the circumcision and the naming of our Lord. Um, so just a little backstory. Uh, I'm going to read what's on the page here. This was part of the Jewish law. And on the eighth, this is a quote from Leviticus. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Um, Jesus was obedient to the law. This event, event is celebrated eight days after Jesus's birth, which is January 1st. Um, why did Jesus submit to be circumcised? Um, firstly, in order not to be considered a transgressor of the law. So first of all, he, he was obedient. He was the giver of the law, and he wanted to lead by example in being obedient to the law. Um, secondly, so that his incarnation for our salvation would not be considered a work of fantasy. So what that means is there were teachers in the early church that said that Christ had not really become human. He was more like, he was kind of like a ghost. Some people even said there were, there were these heretics that said that even when he walked, like he didn't leave footprints because he wasn't real. So this event, right, the cutting of his foreskin and of course the blood that came from that is, is a proof to the fact that he in fact took on flesh. Um, thirdly, in order to school us in humility and obedience, which we just talked about, and fourthly, so that we might also learn to excise from our hearts recollections fueled by the passions. That is the true and holy circumcision. And that last point, the fourth one, what he's saying is he's, he's kind of using an allegory, so to speak. He's saying that in the same way that the foreskin was sort of removed from Christ's, you know, part, that we also are called to remove, to, to cut off with the Holy Spirit the passions, right, of anger and lust and greed and envy and jealousy and all of these things. So that's what he's saying there. Um, so that is the circumcision and the naming. And the next event uh, kind of chronologically was uh, on the 40th day after a child was born, uh, he was presented into the temple. And this is actually both something that was done not just for the baby, but also for the mom. It was, a, it was sort of a ritual purification for the mom because, um, and you know, I, can I, I got to say two little things. Um, 
I, the other day, well, I, I, you know, when people, let me stop this for a second. Here we go. And I can see you all. Um, I, people underestimate the wisdom of the church. That's what I'm about to talk about, right? So now, obviously, at, in, in the time of the Old Testament, you know, they didn't have ultrasounds. They didn't really know what was going on inside a woman when, when she was pregnant, right? Um, and yet, God revealed that she should come back into the temple and sort of be received in. And mainly the, the impurity that she was sort of under was because of the bleeding that was going on, right? Because after you have a baby, there's a period of time when you're bleeding, we all know. Um, what's interesting, though, is that God told them to do uh, a 40 days, to wait 40 days, right? Now, can somebody tell me, after one has a baby, how long does the doctor say, he says, come back in what period of time? Somebody tell me. You got to unmute weeks. yourself. Six weeks. How many days is six weeks? Six weeks. 40 days. Well, 42, 42 days, days. Yeah, rounding, right? So it's interesting, right? What else is very interesting? This is, and then I'll go back to the slideshow. I was doing some research and I, I, I think this was a credible source. So if I'm wrong, I invite any one of you to come back and correct me. Um, but um, vitamin K is actually a vitamin that contributes to uh, blood clots. It helps you clot. I don't know if you know that or not. Maybe you do. Um, interestingly, on the eighth day after a child is born, which is the same day that a baby is circumcised, there's actually a spike in the amount of vitamin K in the baby system, right? Coincidence? I don't know. I think not. Right? So God is, there's wisdom. God, we, we think it's all whatever, but it's, it's the wisdom of God. And God gave this to Moses and Moses gave it to the people. So anyway, that's the end of my tangent. Let's return to the slideshow. Um, so on the 40th day, um, he is presented into the temple. And uh, this is, uh, so this, what we're about to read is, is an excerpt from Leviticus, which basically talks about the, what Moses commanded concerning this. Um, when the days of her, her purification for a son, this is the, the mother, for a son or daughter are over, she, the mom, is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. Uh, he shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonial, uh, ceremonially clean from her blow, flow of blood. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Now, a little notice on this, which I think, uh, well... Let me, let me get a little marker thing here, and here we go. So there's two options, right, for this offering. One is a, a lamb and a young pigeon. And then the other one, which is for the poor, basically is what it says, is to bring, um, uh, if they cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons. I'm circling it on the screen. Now, does anyone remember what Joseph and Mary brought? You can, you can maybe even see it if you look closely at that icon on the screen there. You can just chime in. You got to unmute yourself, though. Was it a turtle dove? It was two. If you look really closely, you'll see two little birdies in Joseph's hands. If you look, it's kind of his things going over. And, and why did they bring that? What does it say in Leviticus? Because they were poor, right? So Christ, again... The, the God of the universe can't even afford a lamb for the purification of his mother. What does that tell us? It tells us the depth of his condescension, how much he emptied himself to the extent to which he took on the most abject, lowly predicament any human could have, right? So I, I just think that's an important thing for us to be mindful of. Um, anyway, let me continue. So, um, continue here. So, um, St. Luke the Evangelist recounts that when the time came for the purification of Christ's parents, uh, according to the flesh, meaning the Virgin Mary, in compliance with the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male child that opens the womb shall be designated as holy to the Lord. So, there's kind of two things happening in this event, right? One 
is the ceremonial sort of purification of, of the mother, which we read about a minute ago. But the other thing that's, that's interesting is that in the Old Testament, if you read through it, what you basically see is that the firstborn of any, any, any couple. So the firstborn, I think I might, is it the firstborn son? Let me see. Hold on. No. So I believe it's the firstborn son. Uh, and actually, it's not just the firstborn son. It's actually the first of anything to open the womb. So that would be the first of an ox, the first of a lamb, the first of a sheep is basically God's, right? So it belongs to God. And so when on the 40th day, when a, when, a, when a couple went to the temple to sort of, you know, do this, really what they were doing is they were buying, kind of, I mean, it, it sounds weird, but they were buying their child back from God. That's what this offering was. I and mean, if you look at it, really, that's, that's how it's phrased. I don't have it here. But essentially, what the parents were doing was they, the, the child was God's and, and the same with a sheep and the same with an oxen and the same with a lamb. All of these things would either be redeemed, which is to say that they would go and offer something to sort of buy that animal back. Or in the case of animals, they could also be killed and they would be offered to God. So it's interesting. Well, and what I think is interesting about that is it, it points to the fact that it, it kind of ties in with this notion of everything like all of our first fruits should be God's, right? Because that's what, again and again and again in the scripture, again and again, it says, it talks about giving the first, you know, the first shearing of the lamb or the first, you know, tilling of the vines or whatever. It's always the first that is God's. And I think that, to be honest, I think that's a very important lesson for us is that we have to understand that, I mean, I'll be, I'll put it in a very crude way, not crude, but simple. I feel like in a perfect world, as soon as our paycheck cleared the bank, we would take out a check, the first fruits, right? The first check, and we would write our stewardship to the church right then and there. That would be the first fruit, right? Because really that's, that's how it should be. I mean, that's clearly the message of the, uh, of the scriptures. I'll, I'll say that. Anyway, any comments or questions? Don't hesitate. All right, I'll keep going. So, um, all right, so any, oh, so that's Q&A. All right, so there's no Q&A, so we'll keep going. Feel free to chime in. So the next event chronologically, so we've talked about the Annunciation, we've talked about the circumcision, we've talked about uh, the presentation in the temple, and basically that's the last thing uh, we hear about the youth of Christ, right? The only other story is in Luke. There's a little story about him going to, the, to, to Jerusalem, I think he was 12 years old, he went to Jerusalem with his parents, and basically he stayed behind, he was in the temple talking with the, the, all the learned people there. But the next main thing we see is the baptism of Christ, right? So we'll talk about that for a second. So um, through his baptism, the Lord initiated the practice of baptism in the church, and by descending into the waters of the Jordan and ascending from them, he prefigured his death and resurrection. That is why through our own baptism, we also participate in a sacramental manner in his passion and resurrection. So another image I, I like is sometimes the fathers will talk about, um, they'll, they'll say that the baptismal font is the womb and the tomb. It's the womb and the tomb. And well, of course, you could probably figure out what that means, but what it means is it is, it is the tomb in which we die with Christ, right? Christ went into the tomb and he died. And then it's the womb out of which we are reborn, right? When Christ rose from the dead, it's the same thing. So it's part, it's our participation in that event. Um, um, and this is an excerpt from Romans uh, 6. This is actually an excerpt from the epistle that is read at the baptismal service. So, uh, and also it's interesting to note, this is actually, what this reading actually is, is it's a reading for Holy Saturday. So if you go to the liturgy on Holy Saturday morning, the epistle reading that you hear is the exact same epistle that's read at the baptismal service. Why? Because Saturday morning is when we remember Christ descending into, the, into Hades, right? And basically liberating all the captives, right? Which is the same thing that happens in baptism. So I remember hearing someone say, you know, he, uh, there was a, a theologian who asked, one of his students, 
why why is the baptism epistle the same as the Holy Saturday? Or, no, maybe maybe the I think the student asked the, the theologian. He said um, we read we read the baptism epistle on Holy Saturday, and the theologian said no, we read the Holy Saturday epistle at the baptism because that's really what it is. And actually, I, again, I, forgive my tangents, but you may or may not know that in the early church. Holy Saturday was really the preeminent day to baptize people into the church. So in the early church, and this is still done here, but not as often, but what would happen is on Holy Saturday, in the liturgy that morning, that was sort of the preeminent day. So during the whole of Lent, all of the catechumens, all the people that were sort of getting ready to be received into the church, they would be taught and they would come and they would worship and they would they wouldn't receive the sacraments obviously because they weren't orthodox uh but they would be you know they'd be reading they'd be learning they'd be teaching everybody and all this and then on holy saturday is the day they would be received into the church that was the day and so when we think of baptism that that's the preeminent day of baptism and that's why this epistle is read and that's why this same epistle is read at the baptismal service so um so now i'll read it um, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So you can kind of see that that same image, right, is, is, is death and resurrection. And our baptism is our participation in that death and resurrection. Um, any comments or questions? Anyone? You got to unmute yourself if you have a question, just so you know. All right. Let's continue. Um, so um, at Christ's baptism, the heavens were open to him and the Holy Spirit came and descended and alighted upon him. Likewise, at our baptism, the heavens open, and Christ sends the Holy Spirit, who calls us to the heavenly home, and he does not simply call us, but calls us with the greatest honor. For he has not made us angels or archangels, but he has caused us to become sons of God. Right? So that's what happens in baptism. You know, when we, I, I've probably said this to you before, I know I've said it at baptism services, but you know, before we're dunked in the baptismal font, right, before we're dunked, when God looks at us, he sees a, a servant, you know, he sees a stranger, he sees a foreigner, and, and after we're dunked three times, when he looks at us, he sees a son and an heir of his kingdom, right? So that's what baptism does, right? It, it changes, it essentially changes us, it changes who we are, it changes our relationship to God from being sort of outsiders and at best servants or slaves to being sons and heirs, right? And that's what we want. We want to be heirs of the kingdom. Um, so the next event is uh, the Holy Transfiguration of our Lord. So uh, as I said before, uh, that happened. Does everyone, can everyone see the icon sort of, kind of? Yes, no? Half of it. Okay. So this is, I'll move. Can you see it now better? Still, I now? only see half. Oh, okay, so I think on your on your screen it must have me like locked in the upper right corner. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. Okay, so um, so uh, the word transfiguration means to take on a different form. Christ, however, was not transfigured by assuming a different form, but by revealing to his three disciples what he truly was. A hymn sung on the feast of the transfiguration says, "Come." Let us uh, ascend into the mountain of the Lord and behold the glory of his transfiguration, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the point here, I would say, is that when Christ went up the mountain and all of a sudden, hopefully you know the story, so Christ took Peter, James, and John, which were kind of his inner circle of disciples. He sort of had he had like the 12, but then within the 12, he sort of had a smaller group that was tighter, kind of a tighter knit group, mainly Peter, James, and John. And um, But when he went up the mountain, all of a sudden he became so bright that one couldn't even look at him. And what this is saying is that it, it's not that he changed or that he somehow took on a new form. What we're, what we're seeing here, what, what he's saying is that 
he actually became what he really was, right? So all of the time outside of the transfiguration, when he was walking from village to village and preaching and teaching and healing the sick, he had a veil over himself, sort of hiding his glory so that people, presumably so that people wouldn't be overwhelmed because we know that Peter, John, and James were overwhelmed at the transfiguration. But just, just for a minute, he went up Mount Tabor just right before his passion and crucifixion. And really the fathers say that he did this so that when the disciples saw him crucified, they would at least know like there's something more to this, right? So they would at least have this hope that there was something more to this person. Um, so that's what happened. Um, I'll tell you a, a quick side story. There's a great story from the life of, let me do this for a second. From the life, I don't know if you guys know who um, he was, Elder Paisios. Now he's called, they refer to him as Saint Paisios of Mount Athos. Very well-known kind of modern, recently glorified saint. I think he died in the 1994, 1995. There's a story, he was very, he had tremendous grace. And there's a story that, I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but there's a story that one day he was praying. It was like the middle of the day, whatever it was. And um, he was praying and all of a sudden, basically, he was engulfed in this uncreated super light of, of God's divinity. And he was praying and whatever. And then eventually it dissipated. It sort of went away. And he went outside after this experience. He read it right after the experience. He went outside. And it seemed to him that it was dark as night, but it was the middle of the day. Now, have any of you ever had an experience where you're like, you're like in a dark room or you're outside in the dark? It's like the middle, it's a bright summer day, just busting bright. And all of a sudden you like go into like a relatively well illumined kitchen or something. Has anyone ever had that? And all of a sudden you're like groping, you know, it's like, it's at like, it's like midnight all of a sudden. But that just tells us what, what I think that tells us is how incredibly bright. I mean, it's it, the word bright is really not even a good word. It's, it's not, it's not bright. It's beyond bright. Um, but how incredibly bright this, this is, this grace of God, which is the same grace we would say that Peter, James, and John saw when they were on Mount Tabor. Um, so, um, Christ opened the spiritual eyes of the three disciples who accompanied him up the mountain and showed them the glory of his face, that is, the glory of his heavenly kingdom. Um, uh, the Holy Transfiguration... Uh, was a further manifestation of the triune God. So not only was it a sort of a manifestation of sort of the brightness and glory of God in Christ, but it was also a manifestation of the Trinity. Uh, the voice of the Father coming out of the cloud, which the cloud being a symbol of the Holy Spirit, bore witness to Christ saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And by concluding with the words, listen to him, God made clear that whoever obeys the commandments of Christ given for man's salvation should be counted worthy of contemplating the glory of his kingdom. So basically, that's the other. We have, and, and as you probably know, another example of this is the baptism, we, which I don't think oh, we did talk about that. But the baptism was also a Trinitarian manifestation. It was really the first uh, Trinitarian manifestation in the, in the ministry of Christ. Um, so... Let's continue. Any questions or comments? Just uh, dive in if you if you have any. Um, so now we're jumping from the transfiguration to the passion of our Lord. Um, so the passion, and we talk about the passion here. What we talk about is the arrest, uh, the trial in front of Pontius Pilate, uh, the imprisonment, uh, the the crown of thorns on his head, the the, the spittings, the the hitting with the, the the reed, the mockery by the soldiers, everything that precedes the crucifixion of Christ. So that's what we're talking about. Um, the passion of the Lord reveals God's great love for mankind. The wound caused by man's sin was mortal, meaning it was deadly. And for it to be healed, it was necessary for Christ himself to become man and be crucified. We needed an incarnate God, a God put to death. <clears throat> um, continuing. The, the Lord's utmost love for us led him to the utmost humility and obedience. Remember those words, they keep coming up. Um, to the divine will, which is man's salvation. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, Philippians 2.8. Every part of his holy body suffered dishonor for our sakes, 
The head endured the crown of thorns, the holy face, the spitting, the cheeks, the buffeting, the mouth, the taste of gall mingled with vinegar, the ears, the impious blasphemies, the back, the scourging, the side, the spear, the hands and feet, the nails. Finally, the Lord willingly suffered a grievous death and burial and the descent into Hades. So that's kind of a summary right there, right? And of all of the suffering that he partook of, right, for us, and so that we could be saved. Uh, because of sin, Adam was indebted to and imprisoned by the devil, right? So, so that was what, that was the key, is that sin brought us, basically made us strangers to God. And all of a sudden, because we were strangers to God, we became effectively the property of the devil. Um, so Adam was indebted to and imprisoned by the devil and did not have the means to pay off his debt. Christ owed nothing, right? He had no debt because he hadn't sinned, but he could repay the debt because he was God. He was perfect man and perfect God. And so he came and through his death repaid the debt on behalf of Adam, who was encha enchained by the devil so as to set him free. So any comments? I'm just going to pause for a second. Any comments or questions? All right. Hopefully this isn't going over your head. I'm always a little nervous. All right. Well, we'll carry on. God willing. No, it's pretty profound. That's why well, we're quiet. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully it's that. Yeah. May that be so. Um, so that's the. Uh, so one more slide. Oh, wait. Here we go. Um, when Hades admitted the giver of life. So now we're talking about Christ's descent into Hades when he died. And on Holy Saturday, we commemorate his going down into Hades. When Hades admitted the giver of life, Christ, its power was undone and the dead were set free. Now, let me pause for a second here. So one thing we have to understand is that, so we, we I have to say a few things to kind of nuance it. We, well, I guess St. Paul says it well. St. Paul says that we are members one of another. We are members one of another. And I think one of the most vivid illustrations of that is the fact that in Adam, all of us die, right? I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. I didn't disobey God. I didn't take, you know, the tr from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And yet, I suffer because of the choice that Adam made, right? Which points to the oneness that we all have, right? We're all united. In the same way, right? And this is the, maybe the, uh, the second important point, is that we are also all united in Christ. And so all that was required was for one man, Christ, right? To live a perfect life, to be perfectly obedient, for us to be redeemed, right? For Adam's transgression to be sort of paid off. And now we're set free from it, right? So there's, it's important, I guess, for us to think of that, to understand that unity, because we are. We're, we are members one of another. We, you know, St. Paul says, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but something like, you know, we, when, one, when one is sorrowful, we all weep. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice, right? So we need to, we, that's, that may not be what we are, but that's what we need to aspire to be as the church. I mean, certainly, that's, that's the message. Um, so let me go back to this. So when Hades admitted the giver of life, its power was undone and the dead were set free. Christ descended into Hades because he had to preach the gospel also to those who were already there, meaning everybody that had died before him, um, to reveal to them his divine plan for salvation, to set them free from the demons who held them captive and assure them of the good things to come. So that's what Christ did. So not only did he save the living, but he went down into Hades and the, and the fathers say that even St. John, because St. John was beheaded, St. John the Baptist, right? So he went down ahead of Christ. And he was all, not only was he the forerunner in the world of the living, but he was also the forerunner in Hades to those who had died. So he, he went down there ahead of Christ and said, you know, he's coming and he's going to redeem us. So um, the devil thought he could destroy Christ by inciting people to put him to death. But Christ's death proved to be the devil's undoing because, unlike every other person who had ever lived, Christ did not deserve death because he had not sinned. St. John Chrysostom offers, I've read this to you guys before, so maybe this resonates and you remember it. St. John Chrysostom offers us a vivid image to highlight this teaching. Quote, it is as if uh, at a session of a court of justice, the devil should be addressed as follows. 
granted that you destroyed all men because you found them guilty of sin, but why did you destroy Christ? Is it not very evident that you did so unjustly? Well, then through him, the whole world will be vindicated. All right, so again, that goes back to what I said a minute ago, is that, that we were members of another, and my, my, my participation in Christ also gives me access to the sinless life that he lived and to the redemption, right, and to the salvation that that then gives me, or at least offers me, right? So, um, the resurrection of Christ. Today, our master has set up the trophy of victory over death and has granted us the way to salvation through his resurrection, uh, proclaims St. John Chris. You know, hold on one second. Let me do one thing real quick. Um, okay, I hear some background noise. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, today, our master has set uh, up the trophy of victory over death and has granted us the way to salvation through his resurrection, proclaims St. John Chrysostom in celebration of Pascha. For he rose from the dead and together with himself raised up the whole universe. Um, so that kind of speaks for itself. Um, on account of his resurrection, those of us who believe in the Lord and keep his commandments no longer descend into the dark of Hades when we die as happened to the righteous in the old days, meaning in the Old Testament. But our souls ascend to the heavenly and luminous dwelling places and enjoy a part of, God, of God's blessedness and their wait to partake of his full blessedness after the resurrection of the dead. So again, kind of talks for itself there. So this is what we will experience. And finally, the last, oh no, there's one more after this, the ascent of Christ. Um, so now, again, just to clarify, we're talking about 40 days after Christ rose from the dead. So for, for 40 days after his resurrection, he basically appeared to the disciples and sort of enlightened them. He sort of explained to them, and all of a sudden, things that they didn't understood, they, they didn't understood, they were able to understand. He explained and clarified. Um, on the 40th day after the resurrection... We're, we, the teaching of the church is that he ascended bodily up into heaven, which you can see in the icon there. You see sort of the disciples gathered around sort of at the bottom of the icon. You see the Panagia in the middle sort of with them. And then you see the angels sort of lifting Christ up into heaven, which is the day of the ascension. Um, as St. Gregory Palamas observes, uh, just as Jesus Christ came down to earth without changing place, but by his condescension to us, so he returns once more without transposing his divinity, but enthroning in heaven our human nature, which he had assumed through his incarnation. So I guess the most important thing about the ascension is that now, and this wasn't the case before, now humanity is bodily in heaven, right? In the person of Christ. So all of a sudden, this humanity that had been had been alien to heaven, had been alien to God, had been foreign, all of a sudden through God's life and, and Christ's life and his taking on a human form and now ascending with it up into heaven, humanity is in heaven. There is a man in heaven. There is a human being up in heaven. Like if we were somehow able to see it, and maybe we will when that day comes, Christ is there bodily in heaven. He, he is up there in a body. Right? His body's a little different, right? So if you remember, um, right after the ascension, I'm sorry, right after the resurrection, um, uh, right after the resurrection, Christ appears to all of the disciples except for Thomas, right? And Thomas doesn't believe. Um, and then he appears again, I think eight days later, and Thomas is there, right? And what happens, though, is that Christ the doors are locked and Christ yet is still able to enter into the room. So the reason I bring that up is because what, what that tells us is that somehow his body, even though it was human, it had the marks of the nails and he, he ate and he drank with the disciples. He asks them to give him food after he had risen from the dead. Uh, yet there's something different about his body. It's sort of transfigured in a way that isn't exactly like ours. So this is what, and in fact, this is what we will have, we believe. This is the body. We will have God's, we will have Christ's sort of, our body will be like Christ's post-resurrectional body when we ascend, <coughs> hopefully, to go into heaven. Um, oh, it's 8.02. So you know what? I'm going to stop because I want to honor my, my time. 
Um, are there any questions or comments? Now's your chance, please. Anything? I have a question, Father. Yeah, Renee. This is Renee. Um, so I don't know if there's an answer to this, but with the descent to Hades, we know that um, basically, like the devil, kind of was surprised by the by, by the resurrection of Christ, by his descent into Hades and resurrecting all those who were in Hades. So how how did he not recognize that he is a god uh, when like we we read of the temptation uh, you know the 40 day the temptations that yeah. he kind of recognized that he is his he is god or so the son of god so what how is it that he how is it a surprise to 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 the devil is that what you're saying right I, whereas I think... when you read about that yeah I, I, that's a good question. I mean, what I would say, so the, well, the question that's being asked, if I'm hearing you right, just so everybody understands it, is, um, you know, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, you know, the demons uh, refer to Christ as the Son of God. And right. um, there, there appears to be, and he raises the dead, and he heals the sick, and he does everything that the Messiah is going to do, right? So it, it would seem pretty obvious that he must be the Messiah. Um, so how is the devil surprised? Well, I, I would say this. First of all, it, the scriptures don't necessarily say that he was surprised. Um, I, I think the devil, you know, I don't know. I mean, my first thought is that the devil is sort of the most prideful being ever created. And nothing blinds you like pride. Um, and so maybe the devil just thought somehow... I'll overtake. I mean, he still thinks he's going to overcome God the Father, right? So maybe he was just under the delusion that somehow this would work out for him, even though it didn't. Yeah. I don't know. That would be the best answer I could offer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but I will say that's more of like, that's, that's more of a patristic thing. And I have heard that, no question. Uh, I don't know that it, it doesn't really appear in the scriptures. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, it has a little bit less force because of that, I would say. Does that make sense, Renee? Yeah, but it, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. 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 Any Thank other you, questions? Father. Yeah, no problem. Anyone? So, Father, I just, I was wondering if this makes sense. Um, <laughs> if, I think it was St. Maximus, the confessor, that said the unassumed is unredeemed. So as you were talking about Saint, this, I think it's St. Gregory the Theologian, actually, because I've, okay. I've, I've, okay. I've, I've put that up, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, so in, if, with that as sort of the backdrop, in Christ's incarnation, he was sort of born into death. If he took on everything that we were destined for, he, he took that on. And he kind of had to die because that was the fate of man. But that was a trap that God laid for the devil. And I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking about that. Does that ring at least reasonable? Yeah, no, I, I think that is a, a valid statement. I mean, even the, the, I know, I can't remember who, but like, you know, one of the one of the fathers of the church uses the image of like a like a fishing hook, and like that like that God's that Christ's humanity was was the worm, you know, quote unquote, and his divinity was the hook, and so when the hook went down into Hades and the devil grabbed onto it, he thought he was getting the humanity, but he was also getting the divinity, and that's what sort of was his undoing, so to speak. So, hmm. right, have you ever heard that image before? No. Yeah, so, but yeah, I would say that's valid. Any other questions, comments, anyone? All right, so I get an A+. Plus. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's close with a prayer then. Thank you for coming, everybody. Mm -hmm. And we'll be meeting again in a week, so join us then. It's good to have you all here. Thank you. All right. Um, thou who at all times and at every hour in heaven and on earth art worshipped and glorified, O Christ God, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy, most compassionate, who loves the righteous and has mercy on sinners, who calls all to salvation through the promise of good things to come. Receive, O Lord, our prayer at this hour and guard our life towards thy commandments. Sanctify our souls, make chaste our bodies, correct our thoughts, purify our intentions, and deliver us from every sorrow, evil, and pain. Compass us round about with thy holy angels that guided and guarded by their array, we may attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of thine unapproachable glory. For blessed art thou to the ages of ages. Amen. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, everybody. God bless you. you. Thank you, Father. Thank you.